Welcome. We're thrilled that you're here today um, and that you've decided to take the challenge of graduate school. For those of you especially that haven't started graduate, this is your, your first program. Um, and I'd like to give a shout out to our online and distance students who are watching from either their offices or their homes or a coffee shop. Um, so it's the first time that we've done this live so that others can watch it from other locations, which is pretty cool. So I wonder if any of you feel like Zia. Uh, Zia is a 10-year-old girl, and we're going to watch her through the lens of a camera that's on her head as she attempts her first ski jump. So as you watch this one and a half minute clip of Zia, I would like you to listen for what Zia does at the top of the hill and what she does at the end of the clip. So I'm going to have you talk with someone next to you after the clip. So that's what you're going to be looking for. What is Zia doing at the top of the hill? And what does she do at the end of the clip? I'll do it. Well, here goes something, I guess. Okay, you can do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump. You got it. Whoa, my ski's slipping off. Just remember, never snow plow, okay? No snow plows. Just keep it straight, it'll be fine. Okay. Anything you do on the 20. Straight. Do you go faster on the in run? A little bit. A little bit? Yeah. Is it any steeper, do you think? Not same, much? Same steepness, it's just longer. Well, just longer. Just longer, just a bigger 20, that's all. Yep. Have it's fun. It's a bigger 20. I got it. Okay. Here. The longer you wait, you'll be more scared. I go. freaks you out. That's the only thing. It's so fun. Huh? 60 seems like nothing now. Whoa! All right. So what did you notice about Zia at the top of the hill? She was nervous. What else? She asked a lot of questions. She had help. She had help. Yes, she did. Her coach was there. It, it sounded like another child was there, if you heard that voice encouraging her. Yeah. Anything else you noticed at the top of the hill? She related it to previous experiences, just another 20. Yeah, another, so, yeah, so she's kind of thinking through all of that at 10 years old, which is pretty good. And what about the bottom of the hill? She was very excited, wasn't she, that she had taken the challenge, she finally took the risk, and she was successful at it. So I'm glad she didn't crash, tell you the truth. <laughs> then I couldn't have used that video. Uh, so graduate school can kind of feel like this video. Um, you're not sure if you're willing to take the risk. Um, so when I, I was working at a university, and some, some colleagues said, you know, you, you need to start a master's program. And I was thinking, really? I don't want to do that, you know. Uh, but, you know, I said, no, you got to do this. And so, so I did. Um, and then after I finished that program, three professors took me to lunch and said, you know, you have to start your PhD now. <laughs> and to tell you the truth, I didn't know what a PhD program was. I was 20 nothing. Uh, and, you know, they said, no, this is, this is what you're going to have to do. And so I did it. And it took me uh, nine years. I worked full time. I took classes at night. And I had small children. Uh, so it took a very long time, uh, but you know, at the end, I felt like Zia. Like, yes, <laughs> that journey is over. So we're glad that you're you're willing to do that as well. Um, you're enrolling in um, a graduate program that represents great diversity, and so I'd like you to know that there are 1,400 graduate students in the College of Ed that will be registered this fall, and that 44 percent of the distance students and the online students for the MU campus are in the College of Ed. So we represent a huge uh, percentage of online and distance. 
Uh, Eight percent of our graduate students are international students representing 44 countries, which is quite amazing. I know that one came from China last night. Where are you? You're still awake. There she is. So that's pretty impressive. Uh, we have students that are enrolled in master's programs, ed specialists, and doctoral programs, so it's a, a huge variety. Uh, we're ranked number 51 in the nation um, by U.S. News and World Report for graduate programs. So if you think about all the graduate programs that are out there in colleges of education, I um, wanted you to know that. Some programs are higher than, than that than others. Um, but so what, is it, what does it take to be successful here? Um, a few uh, years ago, I was teaching a master's course, and one of the assignments that I gave the class was to write a manuscript for publication. And they didn't like this idea. Uh, this was a summer class. It was going to be, I think, a three or four week class, and they didn't think that in three or four weeks they were going to be able to write a manuscript for publication. And they got actually angry with me. And so I asked them to take out a piece of paper and to write down on that piece of paper um, what was uncomfortable about this assignment. And so they wrote a, all this, these huge lists. And then I said, I'd like you to crumple that up and, and throw it at me. And that, does they, they said, does that mean that we don't have to do it? <laughs> and I said, we're going to plan B? And I go, uh, no. <laughs> It's not what they, but I just want you to get that anger out. Uh, you know, and I said, you can pair up with others in the class. So there are 14 in this master's class, and they submitted seven manuscripts. And, and four of those were accepted for, four of those seven were accepted for publication, which is a really high acceptance rate when you looked at the journal's actual acceptance rate. But they took that risk, um, and that's what we're going to ask that you do in your programs, that you take risks, challenge yourself. Uh, but, you know, start writing. Start writing and working with others to, to prepare manuscripts as well. Uh, take initiative to engage, to inspire, and to lead others. Uh, look for opportunities and pursue them. Read as much as you can. I know you're going to get a lot of reading in your classes. Read more. Uh, ask, you know, what, what are the journals that I should be reading? Uh, what, are, what are pieces that I should be reading related to my field? Talk to faculty, get suggestions. And I know you're not going to think you have the time, but you'll find it. Uh, take ex uh, advantage of the expertise and the support that's here. There are a lot of services that are in place. You're going to hear from a lot of different offices today in terms of what you can access. And a lot of students don't necessarily access them. So we want you to be aware of them. We want you to access them. Um, I want you to create a community here. Uh, build relationships with people who differ from yourself. You're going to learn a lot from your professors, but you'll learn more from the other students, the other graduate students in our college and really across campus. So take that opportunity. Um, introduce yourself. Sometimes that's uncomfortable, but go ahead and do that. Um, you'll see those interactions as investments, then it's going to pay off uh, in the end. Uh, in American culture, we often hear the words uh, dependent and independent. So are we de dependent? Never, never we think that's a bad thing. And we want to be independent. Um, but actually, we learn a lot from other cultures that interdependence is really the way to go. And so interdependence is knowing what we can offer to and what we can learn from others. So I'm, I'm hoping that you'll be interdependent while you're here on campus and share your strengths with others and then rely on others for strengths that you're learning, um, you're strengthening your own toolbox. Uh, ensure that you have appropriate balance among all your activities and your commitments. Uh, when I was a doctoral student at the age of 29, I had a stroke. I was exhausted. Uh, I was raising two small children who were two and three was working 60 hours a week for my job, and I was going to graduate school at night. Uh, it took the medical staff an incredible amount of energy to open my eyes. Um, I was just physically spent. Uh, I hope that you'll learn from my bad example and make better decisions than I did. Uh, take walks, sleep, find ways to process stress, um, just relax. Um, do something you enjoy, whatever that is. If it's going to a movie, go to a movie. But make sure you build in that balance into your graduate studies and your personal life. I know that you'll experience the same joy uh, that Zia did when she reached the bottom of the hill. Uh, I hope that image sticks with you for a while, especially on the hard days. Uh, I look forward to shaking your hand at commencement and watching you lift your arms in celebration like Zia. Um, note that Zia did not do it on her own. You all noticed in the video that she developed a knowledge base. It wasn't her first day on skis. She built on her prior experience. She had coaching. She had a more experienced other that was walking her through how to do this and what she should not do and what she should do. Uh, she asked questions. She took risks. And she challenged herself. And I know that you'll do the same. 
So I look forward to meeting all of you. I do have business cards down here. My office is in 109 Hill Hall, and I hope that um, you'll come and talk to me or let me know how we could make your experience here better at, in the College of Education at MU. Um, I would like to thank Norma Jackson. She has organized today's event. And she runs our Graduate Student Initiatives and Services Office. Um, so she's supporting you in any way that she possibly can and also our online contingent. So with 1,400 students, she's very busy, uh, but she loves for you to come visit. Okay, well, I want to tell you a little bit about how the day is going to go and then we'll get started with the program. Uh, we have a variety of individuals from um, the Academic Affairs Unit uh, over in Hill Hall will come and speak. We have a group of campus resources. We have the Campus Writing Program, Ellis Library, uh, Division of IT, a uh, uh, couple others that will come and speak to you this morning. Then we'll have individuals from the college. Dean Clay will be here to speak to you as well as division directors uh, will be recognized, uh, department chairs, other staff members, new faculty members uh, will be in attendance also. And then after that, uh, we will provide you with college education tours. So those of you that signed up said you wanted to tour uh, Hill Hall, Townsend. We'll take you through the reflector, which is a computer lab. Uh, we'll do that. Uh, and then from 12 o'clock to around 1.15, lunch is on your own. And then with the afternoon, you'll go into your departmental session. So uh, ELPA students uh, actually will meet at noon in 314 Hill Hall. ESCP students, 145 in uh, LaFair Hall, which is an engineering building. You should have got correspondence from your departments. Um, LTC and special ed students, 130 and 223 Townsend. And then uh, Sissel students will meet at 130 and 122 Townsend. So we'll go over. With that being said, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. As Dr. Cheval said, um, I'm the director for the Office of Graduate Student Services and Initiatives. Uh, some of the programs, we just highlight a few talking points of what our office has. Um, for We provide an assistantship site, so I'm not sure if any of you are still looking for assistantships, um, but you can go to assistantships.missouri.edu, and all these slides will be on our Blackboard page, which I'll talk about as well. But any open assistantships within the college are posted on that site, so you can look for open positions. It'll have, you know, what required in terms of applying for those positions, who to contact, all that information is on there. And being a current, any current or enrolled graduate student has access to that information. So uh, then we also have a Blackboard site for our office. There's a variety, wealth of information on there in terms of um, information regarding the college, programs, there's writing resources, there's community resources, there's an MU campus calendar, a variety of information on there as well. Uh, we also have a Facebook and Twitter account. And you can see in the packets that you got this morning, in the inside, there's a card on there that has uh, the Facebook information, the Twitter, uh, how to access Blackboard. So hope that you all will like us on Facebook and utilize those resources also. Uh, we also do a featured graduate student. Uh, we'll send out, through. you'll be added to the listserv uh, within the next few days. And with that information, uh, you'll have access to variety of emails that are sent out but one of those things you'll get is we feature graduate students so basically so others can get to know you a little bit better because kind of when you get going in within your departments um, you don't see each other as much so that's a way to get to know others and other programs so I hope you'll take advantage of that also uh, then we also this year are going to start a graduate writing series so we'll have four workshops in the fall there's a flyer about that as well in the packet so we'll have four uh, writing workshops in the fall we'll have uh, two retreats in the spring so you have to sign up for those we'll send out more information there will be individuals from the campus writing program who will talk to you more about that uh, as well uh, then also we have a student resource guide uh, they were on the tables outside, but it'll actually be electronic, and so there's a variety of information, contact information for resources uh, within the MU community, but also uh, Columbia community as well. So I hope you take advantage of that also. And here's my contact information. I'm in 104 Hill Hall. You can either email me personally, or our office does have an email address also, and you can contact me by phone as well. So with that being said, we'll go and honors uh, Dr. Lori Wilcox in Sankot. We'll talk about the Office of Assessment.
Good morning. Um, as no Norma said, I'm Lori Wilcox. I'm the Director of Assessment for the College of Education. I'm also an alumni. I received my um, doctorate degree from the college um, not so many years ago, but starting to put a few behind me now. Um, I also wanted to, um, I'll go ahead and introduce you, Sankalp. Sankalp Shiva Prakash is a um, uh, critical uh, component to our office as well, and one of the things I'll talk to you about today, you'll be uh, interacting with Sankalp on as well. Um, within the Office of Assessment, we won't have a lot of direct interaction with you, but we will hopefully be behind the scenes supporting the things you're doing and highlighting your outcomes um, to the state and to the federal government as we're reporting some of the statistics about our programs. We also work very closely with those departments and programs in our college that receive accreditation. So we're trying to make sure that um, those programs that you're involved in are top notch which is helping us to uh, reach some of our U.S. News uh, rankings and some of those other things as well. Um, one other component I wanted to talk to you about that, that we'll be helping you with is an online um, Sakai portfolio. So Norma has given you information on how to get to Blackboard. The same place on the website that you get to Blackboard, um, courses.missouri.edu, there's um, a place where it says um, e-login, and that will take you into Sakai, which is an area where we've developed um, individual electronic portfolios for you all to be able to use to highlight your work as you're going through your program. So you can look at it sort of like an online resume CV that gives you the opportunity to um, not just put up a CV or a resume, but also to put up work samples that highlight some of the things that you've been developing as you go through the course of your career here at MU and as you get towards the end um, of your time here too when you're ready to get out into the job market and um, highlight all the things that you're um, ready to, to take on. Sankalp will be working very closely with you that with, with that. Um, Michelle Bollinger in our career services area will also be able to help you with the content pieces that you put into that portfolio. Um, Norma will be available as well, and so with that, I'm going to let others speak because, as I said, we're kind of the behind behind the scenes support for you. If there's any questions you want to ask us, um, we're on Two Hill Hall, the Garden Terrace level. <laughs> so any of you that uh, are taking the elevator up uh, can be able to find us. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, on occasion, you will see uh, emails come through from us asking you to uh, complete a survey. Um, I know that we all get sometimes survey tired, but we would really appreciate it if you take the time to fill those out for us. We are using those for continuous improvement efforts within our college. Um, we just would have done an exit survey of our students that were graduating in May. We are taking those results and sharing those with our college leadership team so that we can make improvements. Um, Norma, some of the efforts that Norma is um, working on in her office are a result of things that students told us that they were um, wishing the college would be doing more of. So it's not just a blanket survey that gets put on someone's desk. This is actually information we're going to be using um, to help not only you as alumni once you reach that point, but we continue um, to use that information to help um, better our programs. So it's not me trying to just uh, take up too much of your time. We are trying to better ourselves. So with that. I'm Michelle Bollinger and I oversee the Office of Career Services in the College of Education. Um, I do see some familiar faces. Uh, I think some of you were some undergrads, so welcome back. Um, in our office, um, we are open to all students, um, graduate level and undergraduate level. Um, so that will include our online students as well as our distance students and on-campus students. Some of the things I want to highlight from our office, um, kind of what, what Lori was talking about with the website. Um, what will go on there um, is your resume or your CV, um, as well as the cover letter. And so one thing I want to point out 
is now's the time to get started if you don't have a resume or a CV. I'm sure most of you probably do because you had to have that to get in. Um, but I can help you and assist you with your resume um, and developing that further, your CV, as well as that conversion. And so I see a lot of students that have their masters um, that have a resume that want to get um, a CV um, for their doctorate. So that's something that I can help you with, as well as if you want to have a, if you have a CV and you want to go back to a resume. Um, the personalized job search advice, this is very critical because we have um, such varied um, majors in our college. Um, so what we do is we sit down or we talk via phone or maybe via email. I'm going to give you advice and provide you resources for interviewing um, and uh, just salary negotiations, negotiations as well. Um, if you're a teacher, usually those salary negotiations just aren't going to be there, so it's going to be a little different though for somebody else um, that maybe doesn't work in a school district. Um, the other thing is branding and networking. I think this is something that a lot of people just maybe don't think about, but your online presence, um, how you interact with people, um, in person, you're branding yourself already. Um, and so networking and branding is a very big component as a graduate student. Um, what Lori had mentioned with the online portfolio, that's your number one way to, to brand yourself. Um, so what goes on there is needs to say something about you. So we definitely can talk about that. Um, an online presence for social media as well, that's a very big thing. So if you have any questions, my um, email address is there. If you want to stop by, I'm in 105 Hill Hall. And we do have a Facebook page, so yes, I'm going to ask that you like us as well. Um, and you will be finding information about um, different things that we're doing in the office, as well as um, articles, um, other types of resources that can help you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I am Gabrielle and I direct the Office of International and Intercultural Initiatives. Can I have a show of hands? How many of you completed a study abroad during your undergrad? Awesome. Well, for those of you who missed that opportunity, uh, we would love to talk to you about opportunities abroad. And while we're talking about study abroad, a lot of our opportunities abroad are actually internships with educational systems in other countries. Um, this summer, our students took part in programs in Tanzania, in Ghana, in Rwanda, in Carpe Italy, in India, and some of them went to Korea for the Teach English in Korea program. So if you are interested in exploring opportunities for study abroad, whether you are a domestic student or an international student, just because you made it all the way to the US doesn't mean you don't, we can't send you to Argentina or Ghana or somewhere else. Um, if you're interested in establishing collaborations for your research with partner institutions, we have MOUs with educational faculties in South Africa, in Thailand, in Taiwan. So um, I would love to talk to you about those opportunities. Domestically, we are looking at um, setting up partnerships with Native American institutions and also with historically black universities so that you learn to collaborate with peers at these institutions and you know how to um, think in teams that are highly diverse. There is a lot of diversity, like Dr. Chaval said, right here in the college that you can tap, but we want you to sometimes get out of the box. The programs in our office are under the umbrella of what has been deemed the personal transformational pathways. And I know it sounds a little zen-like, um, and it can be that, but all that it really does is talk to you learn from you, where do you come from, what experiences do you bring to our college, and how can we expand those experiences and kind of push your borders a little bit for your personal and professional growth. So if you are interested in any of those opportunities, uh, whether you want to collaborate with peers here in the state at some of these institutions, minority serving institutions, or whether you are ready to get your passport stamped somewhere else, we can help you do that. We work with our students through the whole process. We, we work with them when they're applying for a passport, when they're applying for visas, and um, 
kind of hold their hand until it's time to kick them a little and, and have them have them enjoy the opportunities. Something else that we are um, seeking to do is with our partner institutions abroad is to bring those educators to Missouri and to expose them to our ways of helping children and at the same time having them bring their expertise to us. For those of you who have traveled many, many miles to get here, Welcome to Mizzou. I am an international student. I uh, actually grew up in Colombia, South America, and I'm a three-time tiger. So like Lori, I have um, my doctorate from Mizzou. Well, I have all my degrees from Mizzou. And <laughs> so M-I-Z. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I too am an alum of uh, MU, so welcome uh, to the graduate school. As the uh, coordinator for scholarships, I have two primary jobs. My first most important job is to help you, the students, with questions about scholarships and to solve problems for you. Um, you really do want to get to know me. I am the money lady, so um, do stop by and see me. Uh, my um, other uh, primary job is to do all of the paperwork and the background work for the Financial Awards Committee. Each committee um, has a faculty member from each of the five programs. And so um, at the graduate level we have uh, 67 scholarships. They are divided among the five programs and then a subcommittee within each program selects the scholarship recipients. And you might say, well I applied and I didn't get a scholarship. Well, it is a very competitive process, and as you go through graduate school, the faculty members will get to know you, and that will greatly increase your chances to receive um, scholarships. And we have $150,000 approximately um, this year for the 2013-14 year. That goes up and down depending upon uh, the generosity of our donors. So it's very important if you receive a scholarship to answer my email when I ask you to write a letter to the donors because of course once they get a letter of gratitude, what do they do? They give more money. So it's a, a wonderful cycle. Um, oh, it's true, very true, yes. And um, our awards range from as small as $200. Uh, our largest award at the graduate level was $8,700. So um, most of our scholarships vary um, are around the $1,000 to $1,500 range. Um, there's a listing there of the different um, types of awards and what they're based on. And um, there's lots of different levels of the criteria level. We have some things that you have to follow and other things are preferences. And the current completed application, that's a biggie. You must do one of those every single year. And, um, and you must adhere to the March 1st deadline. Um, it is an online graduate uh, application. Um, I did that the first year I was here, and I know it made people very happy because they were like, I gotta fill out a paper application and send it to you. Um, unfortunately, because it is um, an online uh, application, at midnight on March 1st, it does close down, and there are no paper copies. So please be sure that you do watch for emails from me. Uh, the second email, the MUCOE scholarships, very important. That is also me, and those are the ones that are saying, I need you to do something for me. Either fill out the scholarship application, um, give me some profile information, write letters of gratitude. So whenever you see those, and I like to put little red signs that say, high priority, even though I know you're going to get a lot of emails from the College of Education, please read those. It has to do with money. You know, we all need money because I know graduate school is a little bit expensive. And this is my phone number. Uh, please know that this is a part-time position. I am a retired educator, so this is perfect for me. I um, work kind of when I want to. Love it. And um, so, and this is a great job. Um, I've had it for now almost two years, and I tell everybody it's the best job on campus because who wouldn't want to give money away? So please do stop by and see me. I'm in the um, advising wing. You'll um, see as you go on the tour today. Um, or just email me. Congratulations on your first uh, semester, and then just like Zia, you'll make it. Have fun. Okay, we'll get started with the next segment. Uh, we have individuals from the Office of Research Support, which are housed within Hill Hall, uh, part of the College of Education. So, come on up. 
Welcome, we are the Office of Research Support. I am Brandi Clements, the Grant Administrator for the college. I have Larry Nossaman, who is our grant writer, and Judy Healy Mendez, who has just joined our office. She officially finished her first week yesterday. Yay! Um, so Ruth referred to herself as the money lady. I'm the other money lady. Um, <laughs> we, um, as you're going forward in your um, graduate experiences, as you're preparing research, we're help here to help you find funding um, to fund your research. There are lots of programs out there that fund graduate students um, for their dissertation work or just to do some small pilot studies. So those are the types of things that we um, can do. So you can come by and visit us. We'll help you try to find funding, help you put those proposals together. Um, and I'm gonna turn over to Larry to talk a little bit more about the details. We offer quite a few different kinds of services. We, we kind of divide our, our office into two different halves. We're, we're kind of schizophrenic that way. Um, Brandy and Judy are, are, again, like she said, the money people. Uh, I'm more the words person. Uh, I can help you look for grants and, and, and if there are different parts and pieces of it, I can maybe uh, review things for you and, and, and uh, help you um, uh, do some uh, writing of, of those kinds of things and help you critique those things. And then we also uh, divide our, our office into uh, optional and not optional uh, services. Uh, my services, the ones uh, that are more the helping you look for grants and, and writing the grants are, are optional. You don't have to use me at all and, and so I'd like for you to so I can have my job security. And why um, people do. Very and, uh, but uh, uh, Brandy's uh, services uh, are less optional. Uh, she is uh, authorized or required by the college to uh, every grant that goes out the door, she's required to, to look at it and review it and give her stamp of approval uh, as for, uh, for, the, for the dean's office. So um, one of the things that we'd like to encourage you to do is, is make an appointment to come and, and visit us in our office. We'd like to sit down and, and discuss some things. Um, uh, in your packet, one of the things that you received uh, is a steps to a career and research funding plan. And one of the things that I'd like to encourage you to, to uh, look at on that page is, are the uh, Blackboard resources down about the middle of the page. They, those are online, those are developed by the MU Graduate School. And there are lots of examples of different kinds of, of funding opportunities. Um, there are uh, things that, that walk you through all the different parts and pieces of the of a grant. They, they walk you through create, creating a budget. They walk you through creating an abstract and a narrative, what all is involved in those things. And then also, uh, many of you may be interested in the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. And the graduate school has also developed a very good resource uh, f uh, website for that, and that link is on that in that section there. Uh, I have these available. My email address is up at the top of that page. If you need these uh, sent to you uh, by email, just email me, and I can I can send these uh, these things for you. Um, do you have any other? For? Yeah, I just want to mention as well, um, definitely talk to your faculty mentor if you um, really are, are interested in seeking funding, um, you're going to need their assistance. Um, unfortunately, as graduate students, um, you're not going to be able to be classified as the primary here on this campus when it comes to administering that. Um, that actually has to be taken care of by the faculty member. Um, mainly because we can hunt them down if anything goes wrong. <laughs> um, but um, talk to your faculty mentor and find out, um, talk to them about what your ideas are, maybe where you're thinking. Uh, also, as you're reading, um, as you read journal articles or any other articles from your field, um, anything like that that is funded by research, it will actually have um, the agency or um, the the um, outside group that funded that research. Those are great ways to get ideas of where you also can look for funding. Um, but like I said, talk to your faculty mentors. Um, definitely get them on board. They can help you a lot. They can review drafts for you. And then like I said, we'll all have to work close together. Um, my other encouragement is from time to time, we do have a lot of confusion. Um, there'll be a posting out there where you think, oh great, I'm gonna go for this funding. And you attempt to, to get it on your own. Um, which sometimes it's very unclear 
whether you need to utilize the institution or whether you can take that on your own. I always encourage if you have any questions about it, if you're ever looking for funding for anything, definitely come talk to us. Um, unfortunately, we've had, um, we luckily not here within the college, but on this campus we've had some grad students in the past um, who have gone on their own and gotten some funding. Unfortunately, they figured out there was a very large tax liability because it was taxed as income because it came as a check directly to them. And also the other thing is, the institution is here kind of as an umbrella of protection, especially if you're going to be doing any type of human subjects research. So from a legal aspect, from a compliance aspect, the university is here to protect you as you go forward and do your research. Um, and again, we had someone here on campus who um, unfortunately went out on their own and did that, and there were problems and they were sued. Um, so again, not trying to do a scare, ta care, scare <laughs> tactic, I can't even say that. Um, but again, we're all here for your protection um, as you go forward and do your research. Um, again, that's the, the beauty and the utilization of all of us. So please feel free to come talk to us. We'd love to hear about what you're doing. We all really love what everybody within the College of Ed does. I think we all kind of have a, even though we're not educators, I think we all have a bit of that in us. Um, and we're always really excited because your enthusiasm and compassion and everything else comes through. And we kind of catch on to that and we really like to see how things go. So please feel free. Um, like I said, Larry's stuff is on here. You can also look any of us up, contact us, drop by the office. We are in 205 Hill Hall. So <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about campus writing program and kind of, kind of by extension I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about another institution, the Writing Center. Um, and really I'll get to how does this affect you? How can this help you? So campus writing program is housed in the Conley House that is actually right across from Townsend Hall. So you could throw something and you'll hit our window. Don't do that. All right, we'll move on. So I won't read you our mission statement, it's there for your review. but. We go on this, uh, this philosophy of writing across the curriculum. You'll hear this term a lot. What does that mean? Writing across the curriculum is this idea that it's through writing, not a standardized test, not a multiple choice thing, but through writing we can learn the most. That there's something almost magical about that process. And this idea has a lot of weight, both in qualitative and quantitative research across the disciplines. Fortunately for you and for me, we are at one of the flagships of that kind of philosophy. This is our bragging slide. Um, we have been ranked among the top 25 of writing across the disciplines uh, thing for the last, I think it's about eight years, nine years now. Right next to Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Cornell, Duke. Uh, you may have heard of them. Um, they'll, they're, they're getting better. They're getting better. <laughs> it's shameless, isn't it? So how do we start? Very quickly, we started in the 80s. Now, most important of all, it was not a kind of a top-down institutional thing where faculty must do this. Actually, faculty got together across the disciplines, tried to figure out, all right, how do we make writing something that we do? Because we can see this, the writing that our students do it makes far more of a difference in their learning. So it started in the 80s, and now we are at over 5,000 courses since 1999 have been taught, designated as what we call writing intensive. And you'll see this time and time again through your TA ships and research assistant ships and so on. So how does this work? On campus, for undergraduate students, all undergraduate students, like most colleges, they have to take the English 1000. Right now, after that, they do something through CWP and the MU departments. They can have one course uh, that's designated WI in any discipline. They usually take this freshman, sophomore year. And then they have a specialized course, so something in their discipline, so in this case, your students would be uh, taking a writing intensive course in the College of Ed. So we add these up, that's a total of six WI credits or more. Many students take more than that uh, for whatever reason, but that's typically how it goes here on campus. All right, so what does that mean, writing intensive? It's pretty simple. These are guidelines, again, set by faculty. 20 to 1 student-faculty ratio. So those of us in College of Ed are cheering at the moment, at least in our heads. This is something so it doesn't happen in a large lecture hall. If it does, we bring in TAs to kind of bring that, uh, that ratio a little closer to the 120. So hopefully every 20 students has one instructor or one graduate student that they can work with closely. Revision. This is, if you haven't learned already, and I'm sure you have, writing is revision. Writing is a process, never a product. 
So all writing intensive courses focus on the idea that you don't just write once, right? You have to keep going with different drafts and so on. They all have drafts. It equals at least 20 pages. Um, so that's kind of a minimum. We have courses, actually a 1600 level course, where writing is the only form of assessment. It's actually more like 90 pages. Um, believe it or not, the students love this class. So writing and revising throughout the semester, and of course writing, assess the assessment is made up of writing as a major portion of that grade. Typically it's around 70 to 90 percent of the course grade is based off of a student's writing. So that's WI courses. How does it work? Again, it starts with the faculty. Faculty come up with the idea, then they send it to us. So I'm one of two coordinators in the campus writing program. I oversee the education courses and the social science courses. So it comes to Conley House through our website, and then it goes to something interesting, subcommittees. This is a uh, bringing together of three subcommittees, all major players in their own disciplines. We've got an education social science committee, the one I oversee. We've got humanities and arts, naturally applied sciences. They all get together, agree what should be designated WI. It goes to the full board, sent for approval, and then it gets sent to the registrar so that students can sign up for a WI class. All right, yada yada, how does this affect me? All right, you're graduate students, so you can, it affects you a couple of ways. One, you can become a writing intensive teaching assistant. That is when you're a TA for a WI designated course. So what does this look like? Well, uh, I would actually encourage you to go over our workshop, but it's actually happening right now. In fact, I'm going to go run over there right after this is done. Uh, but the next workshop is going to be in January. It's a full day workshop. Our, our task is to prepare you. How do you grade student writing? How do you deal with those awkward situations when students uh, come to your class and, and all that kind of stuff. It's a fantastic, fantastic experience. Um, another, way, another way that this affects you is you can become a writing intensive tutor. Now this affects me personally. I was a WI tutor for three years on this campus. And this does a tremendous amount both for the students and especially you. I can strongly recommend both being a WITA or being a WI tutor if you have any interest whatsoever. It's subject specific tutoring. They don't, uh, they don't focus on grammar all that much. So if you're worried about uh, grammar, what they're really worried about is the knowledge of the discipline. Students come to you asking you for your recommendation through writing on, on uh, whatever your particular specialty is. Now, this has natural benefits. Obviously, you're helping the student. This is great. It also dramatically improves your own writing, but more so, being either a writing intensive TA for one of the flagship universities or a writing intensive t uh, writing tutor, this opens up numerous doors. I can tell you from personal experience, things that I never would have considered come to me because of that experience. Uh, Dr. Rachel Harper, she's the magic worker over at the Writing Center, and I'm kind of here in her stead. Uh, she's the person to contact. Hiring has already begun for this next year, but if you are at all interested, uh, go to uh, or email Rachel and she'll start hiring again in May 2014. Yes, ma'am? Is there a cost for the workshop? Or? No, actually, we pay you. How cool is that? <laughs> right, we'll pay you 50 bucks to go to the workshop. Uh, so there, there you go. The next one is in January. So you're a grad student, you need 50 bucks, you can go to it. All right, what can Campus Writing Program offer you? We offer a lot of things for graduate students. One of the things are the monthly writing retreats. These are very, very cool. In Conley House, that, that great little house that we have, we bring together both faculty and graduate students and we leave you alone. How cool is that? Right? We, you can go anywhere you want in the house and write. You have our support as coordinators. You have uh, Amy Lannon's support as the director. But we leave you alone and you can write to your heart's desire all day. This gives you, in other words, an excuse to go somewhere uh, for either professional development or whatever. We also have contemplative writing retreats. This is something that Dr. Donna Strickland over in English has started up. Um, contemplative writing is the idea of mindful writing. So it's, it's, it's uh, mixing writing with meditation, with yoga. It's actually quite interesting and cool. Uh, so I would encourage you to go for that. All of these are different workshops and things that you can sign up to, sign up for on our website. So we have writing workshops that deal specifically with graduate students. Um, we're going to look in, for example, uh, we're having one about how to be a productive graduate student. That'll be coming up really soon. Writing center appointments. So again, now I'm talking my, with my writing center hat on. Because you're a graduate student, they're not directly funded to help you. However, 
Uh, Rachel Harper and the people over at the Writing Center. The Writing Center, by the way, is located right across from the library. They've tried to figure out ways to help you. One, the library has uh, walk-in appointments for graduate students. So you can walk in there, the hours change, so you'll have to go over to the library to check, but there will be a graduate student trained in writing to help you with your writing. Okay, so I would strongly encourage you to check that out. If you need to make an appointment, you can make an appointment at the Writing Center the day of. So it has to be the day of. Again, they're not funded uh, directly to, to help us, but uh, that is an opportunity that's available for you. Okay, if you have any questions, feel free to ask now, but certainly you can contact any one of us to sign up for any of these uh, workshops, the retreats, anything that I mentioned. Our website is cwp.missouri.edu. My name is Jackie Cummins, and uh, I'm also a Mizzou alum from the journalism school, and I've actually applied to the College of Ed's master's program, so hopefully I'll be one of you soon. I'm here to talk to you about some of the campus resources you have available to you, um, especially since this, this uh, discipline is so heavily involved with the distance education. You'll find that you're really reliant on technology. So we've got... Uh, a lot of resources for you both across campus and online. I've got uh, guides with me that will, Norm, I'm not sure how you want to distribute these. I've got a box of them back here. We can put them on the table uh, right in the entryway there so when you walk out you can grab them. Okay. Um, the guide has uh, all of the resources that you've got available to you listed out and it tells you about them. And then the flip side of this has um, all kinds of connectivity instructions. So how to, get your, how to get connected to Mizzou Wireless if you're working here on campus, how to get your email set up, um, how to deal with MyZoo, all those kinds of things. Um, so be sure to pick one of these up because it's going to be a lifesaver a lot of times. Um, quickly, I'm just going to kind of cover some of the big uh, technologies that you're going to be like living with constantly. First of all is your email. Um, students here have uh, email for life. So it's a, it's a Microsoft account and we'll be going through a bit of an upgrade here in about a month. So your account will undergo a little bit of, you'll see a few changes. Mostly it's uh, interface type things that Microsoft is putting through. Um, all of your official communications from the University, the College of Ed, everything goes through your, uh, your official MU email account. If you're working with um, resources on campus while you are off campus, you'll have to use uh, VPN to access them, which is virtual private networking. Your instructions are in here, but it allows you basically to tunnel through um, that our firewalls and our security, so you have a secure connection to your departmental servers, to your research servers, um, to your Bengal account space, which is where you can post your own web pages and host your own uh, pages and things like that. Um, so VPN, it's a, it's a really easy client to use. You just log in, you know, it takes about two minutes to set it up, and from then on, and all you do is, is activate the client, log in, and you're good to go. You can access whatever on-campus resources you need. Um, Mizzou Wireless here on campus is another big technology that you'll be using for those of you who, who do work from campus. Uh, again, it's once you set it up, it's you reconnect to it automatically and, and uh, it's not a big deal. We have, we do want to stress that it is wireless. It's never as fast or as secure or as stable as Ethernet. So when you're working on big projects or it's really important, you know, plug in a cable somewhere. Uh, we have computing sites all across campus, like about 60 computing sites across campus where you can go in and sit down at a cabled machine, log into any of your campus resources or anything like that. Um, and they are, you know, like I said, scattered across campus. So wherever you are, you're pretty close to a machine where you can log in and check your email or submit a paper or print something. Um, you do, as graduate students, have a, a uh, print allotment of $50 a, an academic year. If you're enrolled in summer courses, you get an additional $7 allotment. 
So you can use the campus printers and and print up you know as much as you want. If you uh, exceed your quota, um, then it just goes right to your campus bill. And we do encourage duplexing. It's actually cheaper to duplex. Um, so we have color printers available in certain in specific areas. Uh, each computing site has um, black and white printers. Uh, we have a color plotter available for your use. Um, again, all of this stuff is listed out in here. We also have a website where doit.missouri.edu where all of this information lives as well. Um, so, and also to use the campus printing, we have a service called uh, Print Anywhere where you can actually put a client on your on your personal machine and print wirelessly to a variety of these campus printers. We also have printers strategically located in the student union, in the student center, you know, various places like that where you'll find yourself frequently. Um, and through it all, we have tech support. So whenever you need help, just call us. Uh, again, on the inside of this guide, we've got a whole list of tech support avenues you can use. You can call 882-5000 and talk to somebody. You can walk up over at Tiger Tech. We've got a desk in the lower level of the Mizzou store um, where you can bring your computer in and we'll actually have techs there and we can help you get things set up. Um, I imagine being graduate students, none of you are living in residence halls, but <laughs> residence, res residence hall students also have in-room tech support available to them. And we've got all of our online resources. So that's, uh, you should be able to, you know, you can contact us in any number of ways. We also have Facebook and Twitter accounts. You can contact us that way as well. So do any of you have any questions about technology or any of the resources that you might need? Okay, well, you'll, you'll certainly think of them as you start utilizing these things. So feel free to contact us. We'll get you all set up and get you connected to whatever you need. All right, thank you. Good luck this year. Uh, I'm Paula Roper. I'm an MU graduate as well. This place is, I guess, downright incestuous or something. Uh, and you? Yes. Yes. All right. So, so you can see where you'll be working when you get out of here. <laughs> All right. Well, we're from the library. Uh, we're reference librarians, and our accounts are the education accounts. Now, I'm educational leadership and policy analysis and special education. And Wayne is counseling psychology and learning, teaching, and curriculum. So if you need assistance, then you uh, want to contact us, uh, either one of us. If you can't, uh, if I'm on vacation or Wayne's on vacation, contact the other one and we'll be happy to work with you or relay your uh, inquiry to the other person. We are from the greatest <laughs> public research library in the state. Now we share honors with Wash U, but of course they're a private school. We're a research one institution. We have over three million items. Now the reflector is a nice place and uh, we work with the reflector. We help them to put their catalog online. Kate, a graduate student, a fantastic graduate student, actually because there were distance learners who wanted to get access to the reflector's uh, catalog, we worked with Judy, um, and we are, that catalog is now online, but the reflector has about 13,000 items. We have millions of items. And through us, you have access to the universe of research. Um, we have a new web page that just went up today, and I think it is designed to make the resources, collections, and services of the library more transparent to you, how to access them individually. But uh, just like anything new, there are going to be some problems. So if you find a problem, please contact the libraries and let us know what your thoughts are. Um, 
Now, in addition to the libraries uh, being buildings, we definitely, I understand that there are some distance learners in the room today. Well, whether you are a distance learner or whether you're in uh, your apartment over on Broadway, you can access the resources of the libraries from any place in the entire world. The catalog is available to anybody on earth. However, the databases, because of our contracts with the vendors, because this is how they make their living, and we sign contracts with them so that their databases are only accessible to our affiliates, our students, faculty, and staff. And you can access those from any place. And if you do have any kind of problem accessing them, they're on our site, which I hope is transparent, they will indicate how to contact the librarians, how to contact us for anything if you just want to ask us a question, or if you're having trouble accessing the various resources, there will be contact information and there'll be a troubleshooting, how to troubleshoot whatever it is, which is usually a firewall or pop-up blocker, but it could be something else. And then there'll be, if it is something else, how to contact the person who can help you resolve the whatever issues that you have. But in addition to the remote, for some reason or other, you might want to actually visit us in person. And there, yes, yes, in your packet, the library, there still is a place called a library. Actually, right across the street, I know some of you probably think, eh, I'll just Google it. But, <laughs> but we actually have a fabulous building right across the street. We have a bookmark cafe, which is almost legendary. I mean, you will enjoy coming in and having coffee there and meeting with your friends. We have study rooms uh, that you can book and do um, work together on, on joint projects. But anyway, Ellis is dead across the street. You can't miss us. But we have, and you can see on here, we have a health sciences library. We have a law library. Although it doesn't technically belong to the NU libraries. They went off on their own 30 years ago or something. But they are on campus. We have a journalism library, math, engineering, geology, uh, veterinary science, uh, health sciences. And depending on what your particular area of study is, you might, for various reasons, want to go to one of those branch libraries. Um, one of the things I want you to keep your eye out for, you have a listserv or some kind of um, little online publication. Sometime this semester and again in the spring semester we're going to have graduate student workshops and in those workshops you'll be introduced to some of the finer points of using databases, how to set up alerts and things so that you don't have to redo the research. It'll just come to your mailbox when new uh, articles are published in that area. And also, you'll learn how to use, if you don't know already, how to use Zotero or EndNote. Those are the two that we actually have on this campus. I know that there are other uh, things of that nature, but those are the two that we support. Uh, let's see. Employment opportunities, were you going to mention those? Go ahead. All right. Well, for some of you who do find that you have a few extra hours on your um, available and uh, you want to make a little bit of money. The libraries hire students and you just come in to Ellis uh, to the um, administrative office or you can fill out a form online if you can find it. And if you can't find it, let us know because we will alert the geniuses who put together <laughs> the well, yes, and they are indeed. All right, so I I want you to know that uh, I think uh, President of Harvard said around the turn of the 20th century that the library is the heart of the university. And we pride ourselves on being the heart of the university. And you are always welcome in the library. And we are your friends and we're there to help you get through this. Yes. I'll be merciful and quick. 
That's a line from Star Trek episode, by the way, <laughs> of the 1960s. Anyway, Paula referred to me as Wayne, and I am that Everett Barnes. Wayne is my middle name, just so you'll know that I am the other person here. Uh, she, mentioned, <laughs> she mentioned about the student connection. There is a copy of this in your packet, and Paula's covered the main elements here. There are a few more that I want to cover, and interestingly, some of these have been touched on by the Division of IT and the Writing Center and so on. So just accept this as a reinforcement. We do have a Do It help desk in the library. So if you have questions, you can always go to Tiger Tech at the Student Center. But keep in mind that within the library, we have a computer lab and information commons of well over 100 computer stations. And there's also a Do It help desk right there. So if you want to access certain software or if ha you're having problems, keep that in mind. Also, the uh, person from Do It mentioned about the plotters on campus. We do have a color plotter within the library. So if you need to print off something like a four by eight foot poster, that can be done with our plotter that we have. And we have a color printer and also the standard uh, black and white printers. Paula mentioned uh, some of the study areas. We have also quiet study floors. So regardless of what you have an interest in, like if you want to work together in a group, we have rooms for that. If you want to work out in the open area as a group and talk, that's available. On the other hand, if you want a really quiet study area, we have those designated. So regardless of your interest, we have tried to put together anything that will fit what you want at that time. As far as remote access, you do go through a proxy server as far as the databases that was mentioned by Paula and also the Do It representative. Basically, when I've tried to get in, I just use my paw print, which is really like your email with username and password. So it's very straightforward. And I'll also mention that even though we have many resources in the library, we can get others that we do not have. For example, we can scope out to the rest of the state called our Mobius system and get books from that. We also scope out internationally and get books. As far as articles and journals are concerned, what will happen is we will get a link and it can be accessed electronically if we do not own it. And all of these resor resources are free. And the turnaround time is generally quite good for an article that we don't have. We can get it within 24 to 48 hours, generally. Books, depending on where they're coming from, we can get that as well. And there's almost a 100% probability that we can get what you need, if, unless it's just really bizarre or extreme or something. Uh, also, in addition to books, there are now laptops and iPads that one can check out at our reserve desk. So if you do not own an iPad and you just want to maybe test one out to see how it works and so on, you can do that. The laptops and iPads must be used within the library, but just be aware that they are available for checkout. Dissertations, we can often get those if the other institution will loan it to us. and. The other session about the Writing Center Tutor Station that is within the library and the hours do fluctuate. The hours are not available at the same time as the library and on your information sheet, the student connection, it gives the hours that we are open. Generally speaking, we're open from 7.30 in the morning until two o'clock the next morning. So that's a huge amount of time to do a lot of work if you want to. And keep in mind the information commons, as I mentioned to you just a moment ago, about uh, doing computer type work. You do not need to own a computer unless you want to. You do not need to own a printer, color printer, plotter. We have all of that available, and it will just start subtracting from your print quota when you start doing your printouts for your papers and so on. Are there any questions on anything that I've covered or maybe Paula has covered and either one of us will try to answer them for you? Okay, we, uh, we do have so-called wrap sessions. They are kind of detailed down here on your sheet. Uh, wrap is for research assistance program, not the uh, kind of music wrap. <laughs> 
anyway, if you have an interest in setting up a consultation with a librarian, Paula or I can do that for education type items. And if you want to scope out to classics, whatever it may be, we have librarians for almost any field of study. So feel free to check that out on our website and it will go through an instruction coordinator and she will send it to the person most appropriate to do that. Any questions? We want to wish you well then and keep the library in mind. It's just across the street from Hit Street, the main library, mm -hmm. and you have a map for the branch libraries. Okay. Hi, my name is Dana Briscoe. I am from the Student Health Center. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about your insurance this morning. Um, Jack Haney is also with me. He's also another insurance representative at the Student Health Center. He'll be here in just a second. Um, so the first thing that we're going to, the first thing I really want to stress to you is that with your Aetna Student Health Insurance, uh, we are the preferred provider. So you guys always need to start at the health center first. If it's something that we can't take care of, then we're going to refer you out. That referral is very important. It's the difference between a one-time $250 deductible and a $400 deductible. Okay? So, after that, after you meet that $250 deductible, uh, insurance company is going to pay 80%. The student is responsible for 20%. It's a lifetime maximum policy of $500,000 that is per injury or illness. Also, there's a $500,000 prescription drug benefit that works on a copay. You're going to pay $15 for generic or $30 for name brand. I'm trying to think. Yeah, that that's basically the whole the whole spiel. Um, so <laughs> Uh, let me see, I'm trying to think. So lots of people ask me, okay, so if it's, uh, well, you guys know the Student Health Center is open from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, except for Wednesday. Wednesday we're open at 9 o'clock. Um, if we are closed, so let's say it's 5.30 and you guys are not feeling well, um, you're going to come... Uh, you're not going to come to us because obviously we're closed. So with your Aetna Student Health Insurance, if you are more than 50 miles away from the Student Health Center or if we are closed, then the $250 deductible applies because you cannot come and see us. Now let's say that you fell and broke your arm and you went to the ER and the emergency room set your arm in a cast and then they said you need to follow up with orthopedics in five days before you go to see the orthopedic specialist about your broken arm you need to call the health center tell us what happened tell us I had to go to the ER on such and such a day I broke my arm they're sending me to orthopedics so that we can get that referral in place for you so that you're paying that lower deductible if you're more than 50 miles away from the Student Health Center, let's say you go on vacation to California um, and you get to feeling ill and you need to see a provider, then again, it's that 250 deductible that will apply. Um, you do not need a referral from us. Okay. Do we have questions about anything that I've said? Absolutely. So the prepaid health fee, it's a user's fee that all students pay to use our facility. And starting this year, every student must have the prepaid health fee in order to be seen at student health. Okay? So if you are enrolled in less than six hours of class and they don't automatically add that health fee, you will have, when you come to the health center, you will have to add it to be seen at the health center. Okay, so again, the health fee is not insurance. It is only good on the fourth floor of the University Physicians Medical Building at the Student Health Center. Okay, 
doesn't, once you step off of the fourth floor, if you go to the pharmacy, if you go to dermatology, if you go anywhere outside our clinic, your prepaid health fee does not work anywhere else on the university campus. Is that six graduate credits also? So if you're in five graduate credits, you don't get the No, uh, no, that is undergrad, so you are right. If it's, so for the graduate students, it's a little different because full time for you all is nine. For undergrads, full time is twelve. So it would be, it would be five for you all, I believe. Anybody else? Okay. Yes. If it's after hours and we're in town, does it matter where we go? Um, well, it does not. So at the at the student health insurance, the provider base is very broad in Columbia. So all of the hospitals here are preferred providers. Um, the majority of the urgent care clinics are, I mean, I think the urgent care clinic on Nifon, Grindstone, whatever they call that road, um, it is a preferred provider. If you really, I would encourage all of you to go to the website and look to make sure that you're going to go to a preferred provider. I can tell you with all assurance that all of the hospitals in Columbia are preferred. Good morning. Good morning. How many of you are grad students? Can you raise your hand? Cool. Um, so I work in the graduate school. Long, long, long time ago, I actually was a graduate student. Um, what I deal with in the graduate school is tuition waivers and insurance subsidies. That's why I got to piggyback on Dana. Um, so let's talk about tuition waivers. If you have an assistantship in your department or even in another department and they say you're going to have a tuition waiver, um, the tuition waiver will waive the resident tuition and the non-resident tuition only. Any other fees, including course fees, are not waived by the tuition waiver. Um, Usually, you're notified by your department if you have a qualifying assistantship. If they say you do not, um, you can look elsewhere in other departments and other programs on campus to see if there's any possibility of funding elsewhere. Um, I have been working on all the tuition waivers I've gotten, been quite a few. Um, so they're, they're working their way into the system. Um, one of the things with the way cashiers is set up is that they run the bill on the 20th of each month. It's due the following month on the 15th. In fact, there is a payment due today. The one thing is, yay. Um, the payment is due if you registered for your classes before the 22nd of July. If you did not register before that time period, and like you registered after that, then you won't have a bill due today. Um, so that, that gives you a little bit of a breathing room. The, um, the one thing I wanted to explain was that the bill that you get in the email that's sent to you, it is not updated. So when you look at that bill, that is what your account was on the day the bill ran. If any changes occurred after that time, either you added charges for books or the tuition waiver went in after that time, then you cannot look at the bill because the bill does not update. What you need to do is in my zoo on the student center webpage or the student center within your my zoo account, there is something called account inquiry. It's a link. If you click on that link, it will take you to a page that shows your current balance. That's how you can see what your current balance is. Um, from that page, there is a uh, tab at the top called Activity, and that will take you to a page that shows all the transactions on your account. You can look there to see if your tuition waiver is on your account. That code will be GSSP. That's what you would be looking for. Yeah? <coughs> I'm not sure what you're talking about. Are you talking about? I was my faculty, so I was to, like, get tuition waiver, and so. You're an, a full-time employee of the university, then. 
as a full-time benefit eligible employee, once you have been here at least six months in that position, then you're eligible for what's called educational assistance, which means they will cover 75% of up to six credit hours per semester. Is that what? I do not know about faculty uh, tuition. Okay, so I just need to So you would need to check with your department to find out if that's something that does go through HR or how that works because that, that's not handled through the graduate school. Are you doing graduate or are you doing the program? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
a fall spring kind of thing. The nice thing is the way the tuition waiver program is set up, if you have a tuition waiver for both fall and spring, you get an automatic one for summer, even if you don't have an assistantship. Another nice thing, the insurance covers you through summer, even if you don't have an assistantship, even if you're not enrolled, it still covers you. I'd like to introduce our Dean, uh, Daniel Clay, and he's going to come up and welcome you. He's a rock star. He's always out there trying to raise money for the college, but especially in relation to graduate students and how we can improve our graduate programs. So, Dean Clay. I'm not, I'm not sure about the whole rock star thing. Good morning to all of you here today and good morning to the people that are joining us from afar. 24 years ago, exactly to this very day, I was sitting right there where you were. I was just beginning my graduate school here at the University of Missouri. When that happened on that day, if I could look forward, of course, and predict the future, I would know some things that I didn't know then. One of the things I didn't know then was that during my time in graduate school, I would meet people and make friends that would last a lifetime. So look around you. Some of these people are going to be people that become close to you in so many ways and are going to stay important to you throughout your lifetime. Some of you may even meet a spouse or partner here. Did I see somebody raise their hand? The one of the things that I didn't understand is that the people here are special. The people that are in my class, the faculty, the staff in our community here in Columbia are really incredible people and what I experienced during those few formative years really did change my life in ways that I could never have predicted but in ways that have made my life incredibly rich for which I'm very thankful. So as you look forward to time in your graduate school, take risks, go off the ski jump, invest yourselves. I didn't know then that you get in what, or you get out what you put in, and that's very important. One of the things that I really hoped for was that my graduate training here would be the springboard to help launch a career where I could make enough to pay back my student loans, which uh, I have thankfully done, but also gave me the chance to make a difference in the world in a positive way and to feel good about um, doing that. And it has done just that. So I hope that your experience here is as rewarding as my experience, that you grow and learn as much as I grew and learned in graduate school here, and that you meet the kind of people that help shape the direction of your life and will stay important to you for the rest of your life like I did too. So congratulations on your graduate school journey and welcome. All right, so we'd like our other leaders to come up and I'll introduce them so they can say a few words. Um, but Matt, you wanna start? Matt and John? We have two uh, division executive directors. Um, Matt Martins oversees three of the departments. I'm going to let him say all of them so they get it right. But ESCP, ELPA, and CISLD. And he'll tell you what those all stand for. And then John Lannon is the uh, Division Executive Director over LTC and Special Ed. So let them say a few things. Didn't know I was making a speech yeah. until <laughs> six seconds ago. <laughs> I'm, uh, uh, as Catherine said, I'm Matthew Martins. I'm the Interim uh, Division Executive Director. One of your graduate school challenges is going to be to figure out what the division director means. So by the end of uh, this month, that's your, uh, that's your first quiz. I'm kidding. You're staring at me as if that's, that's true. Uh, I, uh, I oversee uh, three departments. Uh, you'll meet the associate division directors for uh, each department here in, uh, in a few minutes. But I oversee ESCP, ELPA, and CISL, which is Educational School and Counseling Psychology. Uh, educational Leadership and Policy Analysis in the School of Information Sciences and Library Technology. Um, I also want to note that I was a graduate student here, so I was sitting in this room, well, I'm not going to say how many years ago, but it was less than 24. Um, <laughs> not a whole lot less than 24, but a, a few less than, than 24. Um, I would like to echo um, everything that, that Dan said. I had a tremendous experience here. Um, it, it really 
served as a, as a springboard for my career. And I had the opportunity to come back a few years ago as a uh, faculty member and I jumped at the chance. Um, and I didn't meet my wife at this orientation, but I did meet my wife at the department specific orientation. So pay closer attention this afternoon because <laughs> you never know, you never know how it's going to turn out. So thank you. Welcome everybody. Well, it's interesting that we have a, a new attraction to MU is this opportunity, I guess, to meet someone. It, it's not quite like a speed dating experience, a much more lengthy experience, which I think is actually very helpful. Um, I'm John Lannon. I'm the Division Executive Director for Learning, Teaching, and Curriculum, which deals with most of the teacher education, and also um, the Division Director within Special Education. I know the Associate Division Director from Special Education couldn't be here, but you'll be meeting that individual, Tim Lewis, this afternoon, so those people that are in Special Education. But I also would like to um, just welcome you. I was talking to a few of the students that were here. I was saying one of the opportunities that you have is you can meet people. There'll be people here from all around the world at MU. It's really an opportunity to step outside of you know, the environment that you've been, been in before, understand some people from a very different background, different culture. So it's a very, very exciting time to learn. Um, again, I, I did go to graduate school a little bit less than 24 years ago, too, which I can claim um, proudly. But it's just such an exciting time to learn different things, learn about different people. Um, we're very excited to have you here. Um, you play such an important role within the College of Education. All right. I'll introduce James Tart since he's here. He's the Associate Division Director in Learning, Teaching, Curriculum. So he oversees um, the role for most of the teacher education, the people in math, science, art education, etc. Matt's going to go ahead and do I think people on this division. Okay, we have uh, three uh, Associate Division Directors in uh, my division. First, uh, Chris Riley Tillman who is the Associate Director for uh, Educational School and Counseling Psychology, ESCP. Dr. Joy Moore. You guys are all sitting in the same line, this is why at this point. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Joy Moore, who is the Associate D Division Director for CISL. And finally, I'll point again, Dr. Jenny Hart, who is the Associate uh, Division Director for ELPA. And you'll get a chance to uh, hear much more from them this afternoon at the department-specific uh, orientations. Can I just do a shout out for Brad since he's yeah. here as well? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Brad. Yay, Brad! We're just going to press it down the line. And Brad Kurz is here from Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis, and he's the director of graduate studies. Any other faculty here? I'm Dan Lowry. I am the co-director along with Dr. Mike Poulos for the MU Partnership for Education Renewal. As some of you get into your doctoral studies, uh, you'll be visiting with myself because some of the programs we have is collaborating with the K-12 public schools. We are the largest educational partnership in the nation. Okay. Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you for all them coming out. Just a few uh, final things and let you uh, go on your campus tours and go on to your department of orientations. Just want to say thank you uh, to our door prize sponsors. Jessica did a lot of hard work running around Columbia and making phone calls for door prizes. We still have some more to give away before we get out of here.